Welcome back to the Black Letter Podcast. We set out to create an entertaining and exciting podcast about law and business, and I think we've done it. Black Letter, the name, comes from the Gothic typeset that was originally used in the Gutenberg Press. Over time, Black Letter became the only font that English law books were printed in. Everything else was printed in regular type. It made it harder for kind of the common person to understand what the English law books said. Black Letter came to represent something that was law, that was set in stone, that was sort of old and a well-settled fundamental principle of law. We're here to demystify Black Letter law. We're here to demystify things that happen in business and law and where those two meet. And I hope you have fun listening. There's dozens of studies out there that, uh, and Berkeley did probably the most recent one that I can think of, that connect donating and volunteerism and doing good, social giving, directly to healthier, happier teens, less stressed, less anxious people. And so these early mental indicators that we focus on to reduce burnout with three good are directly impacted by people, giving people exposure to these social good projects tied to the water crisis. And even as they look at it, they become de-isolated and then they donate increments. Even 50 cents a month can make a change in someone's heart and mind. In terms of the philanthropy, what I like to think is that it's not government's job to do everything for all people. It's our jobs, right? And no, no gift is too small. You know, whether it's, you know, your, your time, it's making blankets for troops that are overseas, making cookies and having a bake sale to help, you know, a local homeless shelter, whatever your passion is, it's up to all of right. us to put back into our own communities. It starts here. I've always thought that and I've always lived by that. And I, I hope everyone else does. It's not big government's job or even local government's job to take care of all needs. It's ours as yeah. members uh, and as part of a community to help each other. Practicing kindness is its own reward. It feels almost as good to the person that's doing it as the person that's receiving it. And from a business perspective, you know, it's just, I don't know, you call it karma, call it whatever you want, but when you spend your time thinking about other people, whether you're thinking about your, your customer, whether you're thinking about your neighbor, whether you're thinking about a relative, or your kids, we think less about ourselves and more about other people the better we feel about ourselves. So what is this exchange bit with um, saving the planet and clean water and all of those other things that are going on in this transaction? How does that work? Yeah, great question. So the, really the reason I started the business was my travels to India primarily, South America uh, in my 20s. And uh, I, I really saw that women were really impacted by not having access to safe water. That was like the trigger for me to start this business. Wow. I wanted to figure out a way to end the global water crisis. And so as 3Good grows and the more employees are on the platform, as we bring on subscribing businesses, the more employees are donating directly towards the world uh, uh, global water crisis. So therefore, as the company grows, impact grows. We put a donation box right next to the ramp. And it's interesting. You will see some people who come through there who are poor and church mice. They're scared that their car is not even going to keep running for them going through there. It's clear that they're just poor and poor can be. And they get a couple of meals and they put a dollar in that box. Then you get other people come rolling through there in their nice new SUV, maybe it's a Mercedes, maybe it's something else. And they don't get any food, but they slide $100 or so we had one person slide a $500 check into that box. And so we encourage that cross uh, connection between rich and poor. We're all in this together. And I think that's motivational as well. Essentially our goal by 2030 is to create $100 billion worth of global market impact through the power of women leaders and entrepreneurs who are starting growing and scaling businesses across the globe. And we're so, um, you know, especially in a time like this, so committed to the work that's happening here because fundamentally as, as much as, you know, we say women are never gonna elevate to our fullest potential if we're not working side by side with you guys. For women, you know, we drive 12% higher revenue, 35% higher return on investment and reinvest 90% of what we earn into our families, communities, ultimately the world. And so what drives the why 
behind everyone here at EBW is frankly, we got to get our social health and economic well-being of women, but the global economy back on track and thriving again. And women are at the, the activation of women are really at the core of, of that engine. When COVID first started, it, it's amazing to me, you know, we were seeing in January, February, like news reports from China and things like that, right? But nobody was panicked yet, right? Right. And then within a period of like two weeks in March, like all hell broke loose, right? Everything started shutting down and everybody started wearing masks and like it happened like almost overnight, it felt like. In that time frame, um, you know, and the hospital cases are rising all of a sudden alarmingly and all that kind of stuff. We were at a point at that time where we had like drums of waste alcohol that we would normally just send to a recycler. And it's basically alcohol that gets used for cleaning, you know, like car parts at a, at a mechanic or something like that. Is that and, the head? Is that right? Yeah, it's the head. That's right. Yep. And so we had drums of that stuff sitting around and we were like, well, you can't drink it, but you can sure as heck clean and sterilize your hands with it and your countertops and things like that. So we started immediately giving that stuff away. You know, in the early days, like there was no packaging. It was BYOB, bring your own bottle, right? I was filling Gatorade bottles. And then we realized, you know, FDA wise, we needed to put a sticker on it that says non potable don't drink it, you know, right. poison, whatever. Um, so we started doing that. And I mean, I had nursing homes, wastewater treatment facilities, all the sheriff's deputies, you know, EMTs, all these people showing up at our door with plastic jugs, you know, to fill them up. Right, because you couldn't buy it, right? It right. wasn't on, it, it like wasn't, the stores were out. Right, because you remember yeah. the toilet paper shortage, well, there was also the Purell shortage. Like there was yeah. no, the supply chains couldn't keep up with the instant surge. And then on March 20th, uh, now over a year ago, I literally back to back five calls and I'm sure you get the same thing, but five back to back, like desperation. Yes. We um, had a lot of those. <laughs> yeah. And they were, and, and it was the third call for my younger brother, who's an ER doctor. And he was, uh, what was it? It was like six days on the same mask with eight COVID patients, oh, he contracted, which is awful. Yeah. And he was like, is there any way you can activate your network to help us? And and that was a Friday. So give me till Sunday to assess the situation and, and see if this is something that not only can we help you, but where I saw, uh, you know, we could really bring value in the marketplace. And by Sunday, we had assessed and we have uh, such a unique network and sort of access to opportunity around the globe that uh, made the decision. And by that Monday, our distribution company had pivoted to serve healthcare and it literally took off like a rocket. If Ingrid Vandervelt could tell a business or a corporate counsel advising a business something, what is that? Yeah, so the first thing that I would say is just um, on the enterprise side, the awareness that women are controlling 80% of the uh, global wallet spend, 70% here. Wow. And I actually think it's it's 70%, 80% in the US, 70% worldwide. And that number is just growing. And so for organizations that are looking to create a foothold that can expand in the future from a financial perspective, the activation of women is, is really critical okay. uh, from, from a business perspective. And we'd love to help you with that. So that's, that's point number one. Point number two is to women and diverse leaders that now is your time. I mean, we've, we've talked about that. Uh, we've, we've talked about how the market has really shifted the way women are coming out, approaching things. The confidence is far higher than it was pre COVID. And now with just a little bit of support, that mentorship, that know-how, that uh, support system, now is the time for women to enter that ecosystem. And and I think I would wrap it up, you know, three by just saying, EBW is one solution and there are many out there. What makes us unique is that we have this network and we've got both, we bridge both sides of enterprise and these leaders and entrepreneurs. And, and we know how to make these relationships and initiatives happen in a way that drives financial value and impact value across the organization. Okay. So would love to have a conversation and get involved. But yeah. uh, those would be the three things and just really take action. Take action now because it, uh, what worked in, as our chief marketing officer says, what worked in 2017, 2018, 2019, and absolutely 2020 does not work anymore. It's right. different. The world's changed. So, so to summarize, we're saying 
remember the spending power of women that the pet not just the spending power the commercial power that women have in the marketplace now because it's massive they have more control over the global marketplace in spend than men do and now's the time to take action especially post pandemic especially especially with this administration the initiatives that this administration in the United States has and our renewed relationship with the EU and other countries that value this stuff and especially corporate actors who are taking action now with voting laws it now's the time to do these things and then the third thing you want everyone to take away is call Ingrid cuz you <laughs> this is what you're doing or EBW got a whole team of executives don't, who are absolutely yeah. amazing. Yeah. So, but, go, but go to um, EBW2020 forward slash grow, check it out. And that is a place to start networking and thinking about these things uh, and to get moving on these initiatives. Is, is that a good a good summary? That's awesome, Tom. I okay. really appreciate it. We appreciate like it, hat. whether we like it or not. The reality is all of us, men and women, I mean, we're going to have those moments where we're doubting ourselves for one reason or another not feeling super confident right. and it's in those moments that it's so helpful to have people around you being like of course you feel that way you're going after a new opportunity that you've never done before and you're not quite sure if you're fully qualified but go for it and you will figure it out one of the biggest challenges of finding women and diverse leaders that actually meet what you're looking for when you're executing at the kind of scale that you do is simply people like you said that can really get the exact job done. And the right. only reason for that is because historically, you know, women and diverse leaders haven't had a seat at those tables. And so this whole idea of how do you think and execute big, there is a dearth of knowledge around that because it's it's just that. So this is where again and and EBW kind of steps in and helps bridge that gap. I mean, we're sort of like an insurance policy, if you will, right. risk mitigation strategy for companies like you or the government that are saying, we want to try something new. We're really concerned that if we do a $100,000 contract or put this position person in this position, is it going to work or not? And we help bridge that gap and say, we'll guarantee that this thing is going to work. So you'll so team I'll, with people to back them things because I know that teaming is a big part of that. And yet being women owned yourself is really going to help with those teaming relationships. If you were giving advice today, you would say you've got to package the mystique of where you are. You've got to think about the saturation of the market right now and build your brand from the ground up from a regional tasting room successfully before you move forward yeah. and, and dip your toe in to see where you are. So those are kind of, that's the kind of the, that's the distillery advice of the day. Absolutely. Um, as long as we've been around for, for 12 plus years, and I think we're, we've been pretty successful, we still have distributors who won't even return our calls. Yeah. It's, and if you're a nobody coming from nowhere, forget it. If you're talking to a business right now, say you're talking to council for businesses or a mid-sized business, what piece of advice could you give them from your business when they're looking at market channels or trying to figure out how to be discreet or be better or go to market digitally, which is what you do? What like one, two or three things would you say? These are the things you must know, you must remember. If you really want to get to the heart of it, you have to be honest and that it's so much easier said than done. You have to be honest with yourself. If you really want to make an impact and innovate, you have to be honest with what is your brand. Are you really appealing to the right people? What's your advice to a company that looks at itself and says, okay, well, if we're being honest, this is what we want to say, but this isn't who we are. What, how do you, how do you, you know, reconcile those things? Right. By the way, that latter group that you just described is not the norm. Those are the true digital transformers. When you really understand that you have a problem, that's when the fun begins. That's right. when the good times roll, you know? So to get there is actually a lot harder than it sounds. But if you're there, you, you're 50% of the way there. So to answer your question though, how do you really make sure that you're, you're making those appropriate steps? One of the best things that we have available to us now, both as attorneys, business owners, you know, innovators, is there's a ton of data and, and data can tell you just about everything that you want to know. Use multi-modality so that your clients can find you. The world is such a digital place right now that the more content you put out there, by the way, video performs better than, you know, uh, just audio. I mean, there's just very easy right. ways to get ahead.
And the biggest way is, you know, I, I see a lot of times, because I still do a lot of pro bono work. I focus more on special education and things like that. Sure. Uh, but I still practice and have, you know, several hearings a year. The number one thing I find is that law firms write about cases almost like they're writing for other law firms, and you're not. Right. You're writing for your clients to find you and understand just enough to know they need you. Do you have a few things that a lawyer or a business person could take away? Our listeners, and they're a diverse group, but pretty much business focused. That's why they're listening. That they could take away from your experience, that they could gain from your life. Sure. I mean, I think my very first tip would be to always uh, uh, schedule time for networking because it was really through networking that I learned the most about how to improve myself. It was through networking that I made contacts that led me to bigger and better contracts and opportunities for my business. And today I can say I'm really proud of my network. My network is unbelievable. And I've put 20 years into it, so I have an amazing network. And one thing I love to do is connect people. I love to connect people in my network to each other. Uh, that has been a huge part of my success. The second thing would definitely be to join a peer group. There's many out there. There's entrepreneurs organization. There's young presidents organization. There's, there's probably 20 or 30 different peer groups. And it's like having an advisory board for your business. And for me, that was Vistage. And that was the single best decision I ever made. Uh, with all the learning that I was able to do there. And learning from the other CEOs was key. And then the third tip really would be to be a lifelong learner. Always try and improve yourself and, you know, read business books and maybe join a business book club where you talk to other people about what, what they've seen because I just have this approach to life that I know nothing and that I always want to improve myself. And that has really served me well. So if I could sum it up then, your, the three things would be um, one, make the time and then execute on it yes. uh, for networking. And then the third thing was always be personally growing, be a learner, get yes. the books about your business, I guess, that are relevant to you. So I love that. So make the time to network, do the networking and join a peer group and be a lifelong learner. If you look yourself in the mirror and you have any doubts at all about whether or not you should start your own business, Go get a job. Yeah. You cannot have any doubts. And if you do, you, you won't be willing to, to make the sacrifices you have to make to make it work. I mean, I made a lot of sacrifices, a lot. And I worked hard and I worked all the time. And was it worth it? I suppose, yeah. You know, I have the life I have now because of it, but I don't want anybody to think that it's just a cakewalk. One out of 30 businesses make it to the 10 year mark. One out of 30. Right. Odds aren't you. Yeah. So, uh, if you're gonna do that. So that's really, you know, make sure you plan for what you're trying to do and you know what you're trying to do going into it and stay focused. As a general rule, most people, when they want to be happy, when they want to move forward in life, they want three things. They want to feel loved, they want to feel respected, and they want purpose. Those are the three things that most people are striving for in their life. And if you can find one or two of them, it's easier to find the other. Right. If you if you've got love and, and and you've got respect, easy to find purpose. You have purpose and respect, easy to find love, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So the thing that I was lacking as a teenager was purpose. My father passed away when I was around eleven. I was a, a a lost teen, and the Marine Corps gave me purpose. So oh my God, was it the, exactly the right thing for me? I'm not a guy who thinks the draft is the right answer. I think the military is, is voluntary. You should join if it's right for you. It's not right for everybody. But I will tell you for sure, it was right for me. One of the things I think everyone should be thinking about is what is the outcome that you want, right? I don't, I, while I want to be moving, I always am moving in the right direction, right? So what is the outcome that I want? I want my mom to not be a hostage. Okay, let's start moving toward that, right? I want to be happy in my business life. Let's start moving toward that. What I tell people often when they say about, I want to leave my job, I want to change this, I say, I don't want you to run away from anything. I want you to run towards something. If you're running away from gotcha. something, you're very apt to make a bad decision. But if you're running towards something, you're much more apt to make the right decision. I mean, you may screw up no matter what, and you might get lucky and make the good decision. I mean, who knows? But we got to put our, the, the odds in our favor. If I'm like, I hate my job, what's next? And I just grab the next thing. I'm probably gonna go from bad job to bad job to bad job. And I'm gonna break my resume at one point 
I'm going to be 50 something and unemployed. That's what I don't want to happen. But if I'm instead saying I want to move towards something, now I'm going to be moving in the right direction. If I make an error, it's probably, I'm probably failing forward versus failing backward. So you always want to be moving towards something. There was a part of me that was still in what I call the, the employee mindset, meaning that the employee mindset okay. says, if I work, I get paid. So boss, I was here for eight hours, give me money. That makes total sense. You're being paid for your time. But when you're an entrepreneur, it doesn't matter how hard you work. It's irrelevant how much you work. If you don't close deals, if they're not for the right price, you don't make money, period. And if you can massively close deals by working an hour a day, you'll make a ton of money. It doesn't matter. How can you close deals? That one hour a day or 25 hours a day? It doesn't matter. And that's where I had to learn that idea right. that it's about being effective and efficient, not just showing up. Doing the hard work, while it's important, simply isn't enough as an entrepreneur. You've got to be effective and you've got to be efficient. It isn't just hard work anymore. That's all for today's episode of Black Letter. Thanks again for listening. Join us next time when we talk about more Black Letter issues in creative ways. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast on iTunes and Google Play so you never miss an episode. And to catch us on video, check out our website at blackletterstudios.com.